well, what a 72 hours it's been, right? Um, uh, there's this uh, constant saying in the Indian military, and uh, you will hear officers say it all the time, uh, that there is no such thing as peacetime in this country. You know, we have a, in our gallantry medals, there are wartime gallantry medals and peacetime gallantry medals, but there is no such thing as peacetime. So it's a, uh, a very permanent kind of misnomer in the Indian context. And uh, the events of the last 72 hours, I don't even need to tell you what those are, have completely transformed and colored the complexion of the session that you're about to watch here. And we've got a fantastic and very privileged uh, list of guests here. Uh, the country's attention over the last 48 hours has been on an Indian Air Force pilot uh, who returned to our country yesterday. That momentarily distracted us from the airstrikes in Balakot in Pakistan. And that in turn momentarily distracted us from uh, the fact that this entire episode began with a horrific terror strike in Pulwama in South Kashmir. India currently stands at a very critical juncture. The pilot is back. We've struck inside Pakistan. The world is watching us and it is very important to actually figure out how India is going to navigate the next few days, weeks, months, what our strategic objectives are. And that's why I want to make this session prescriptive. It's not a TV debate. It's going to be about what next. And that's why we have such a fantastic panel of guests. So I want to start with Air Chief uh, Marshal Major, uh, who as Air Chief during the 2611 uh, Mumbai terror attacks, uh, famously prescribed airstrikes at that time. They didn't happen for whatever reason. But Air Chief Marshal, my first question to you is, from everything that we know so far over the last one week, and there's been so much to absorb and digest, what next? I realize that's a broad question, but as a military chief, what do you see happening next? Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Shiv, what happens next depends on a lot of factors. It depends on a lot of factors. Uh, firstly, what is Pakistan's reaction after what has happened and, the, and the, our POW has been returned? What is their intention in the short term and in the long term is another issue which needs to be factored in. But be that as it may, my gut feeling is that till such time India is provoked again and if provoked, we have a lucrative target uh, once again across to use any kind of force, be it air power, surface based, uh, 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 I mean, uh, cross border attacks or whatever will depend purely on if you have a look, otherwise what do you hit? We don't want it to be a military target. We don't want to hit civilians. So what will you, how will you retaliate? I'm talking of the military retaliation. There are many other aspects and there are very uh, distinguished people who will cover that. But as far as I, I know that till such time there's a provocation, I don't think, I don't see anything happening in the immediate future. Okay, so you're saying that as far as uh, all the speculation over whether India will escalate now that our pilot is back, what the next step is, you're saying that if there is another provocation, then there are options at hand and India has demonstrated that we can strike within Pakistan. General Huda, you were the uh, Army's General Officer Commander-in-Chief of the Northern Command during the famed trans-LOC strikes of 2016 after the Uri attack. What would be your prescription now? The army is very much involved as we speak. You know, even as the pilot was coming back yesterday, uh, there were, the, the, the line of control was completely lit up across sectors. That's something you're very familiar with. Again, as a military commander, what would your prescription be and what should the considerations be at this sensitive time? Uh, see, you know, I think we need to take some lessons from uh, what happened post-2016. Uh, and we did do a, we did do a strike uh, across the border. 
uh, what we saw uh, unfortunately was, you know, we've seen a series of sort of attacks that have continued from Pakistan. So are there any lessons that we should actually take from that? Uh, and one major lesson in my view is that you need to have a consistent uh, approach and policy towards, uh, towards Pakistan. If you're just going to celebrate, you know, one strike and say, uh, this is it. So I don't see um, how and why uh, Pakistan could change its, its behavior. So in that sense, I think uh, the Indian government's reactions after Pulwama uh, have been uh, much stronger, have been more consistent. Uh, diplomacy has been you know, more effectively applied this time than, uh, than it was done in the past. Uh, what is it that we, we want uh, you know, to achieve? And uh, what we want to achieve is that you need to deter Pakistan. I'm, I'm not sure it's going to happen immediately, but we need to deter Pakistan from carrying out, uh, you know, cross-border strikes in India. And so how do we do that? So you have a military option, you have a diplomatic option, uh, you have international sort of leverage. Uh, so decide on a path and say we are going to follow this path consistently uh, over the next few years. Uh, let's not look for short-term solutions. I don't think we will get them. But let's at least have a long-term uh, approach. And if, if the military is, uh, you know, a part of that, sure. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's the main weapon for deterrence. So, again, as I said, you know, a long-term consistent policy is what is going to uh, sort of pay us dividends. Okay, so a consistent strategic objective needs to be uh, on track, it can't be derailed by ad hocism. Uh, uh, Mr. Menon, as you know, a former national security advisor, the, the thing that's been in the headlines, the cover has been the military stuff. We've seen the airstrikes, we've seen what happened in Pulwama, we've seen our pilot coming back, the dogfight. That's what's been in, you know, in, in public view right now. Behind the scenes, of course, there's been a lot of diplomatic pressure. We've read about that as well. That's one of the reasons why uh, this pilot was returned to uh, us very quickly. How do you see uh, our foreign policy objectives? Uh, is there a need for them to change at this point of time? Because we've crossed, like the Air Chief said, we, we've demonstrated our ability to uh, you know, conduct a conventional strike against terror targets. How do our foreign policy objectives vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan need to change now? Well, you know, what you do next depends on what you want. Do you want to change Pakistani behavior? Then there's a whole set of things you do. And there is no either diplomatic or military. None of these alone will work. You need a whole set of things that you do in the way you deal with Pakistan. Or do you want to degrade jaish e mohammed to actually attack them and other groups like them, Lashkar, etc.? Then you have a different set of, of things you do some overlap between the two. Or do you want to win an election? Then there's a whole different, there's still some overlap, but then you, you choose to play it differently. Then you have to do it publicly. Now, the problem for me is that most of the stuff that will actually change Pakistani behavior or degrade Jash, for instance, has to be done covertly, quietly, and is a long-term problem, as General Huda said. It's something you have to do over years, you have to apply pressure, you have to raise costs. What we did this time was good. It showed a will, it also raised the costs. But that's not a solution in itself. It has to be part of a longer term process. But unless you have that clarity of where you want to go, frankly, it's very hard to say, okay, these are the things, prescribe what the things that we should be doing right now. Uh, diplomatically, I think we have and this is part of the issue. We have signaled both things at the same time, that we want to improve relations with Pakistan, but that we will not talk as long as terror is going on. And we've said many things. Uh, I know this is unsatisfactory, but you know, you are dealing with many Pakistans. To my mind, there are at least five Pakistans. There's civil society, there's Pakistani business, civilian politicians. You really don't have a problem with them. Your problem starts with Pakistan army, the jihadi tanzims. Oppose them, fight them. So you cannot have one policy which deals with all of them. Because if you have one policy, you're pushing the first three into the arms of the others. So for me, you will have the same kind of diplomatic ambiguity, let's say, to put it pol politely, in the way you deal with them. But I think you should measure how far you have succeeded. And this is India succeeding. Yes. 
because it's several years. 50 years ago, the OIC at Pakistani instance wouldn't let you in. In fact, as good as chased you out. Now, your foreign minister has spoken to an OIC meeting, India's foreign minister, made a speech that, by the way, any of India's foreign ministers could have in the last 30 years. And the Pakistani didn't even attend. That shows you how far you've come diplomatically. But as I said, even that is not enough to actually change Pakistani behavior. You need a combination of all these things. Uh, Mr. Faisal, you know, uh, given the rapid pace of the events over the last 72 hours, uh, one needed a, a reminder sometimes that this, this circle of action began with the terror attack in Pulwama. So this is about Kashmir. Pakistan says this is about Kashmir. India says this is about Pakistan-sponsored terror. As someone, you know, who used to be part of the system in Kashmir as part of the administrative service, you've chosen to give it up, uh, and you, you, you know, you want to enter the political sphere now. How do you see the actions over the last few days? Do you think they're consistent? Because you've been a critic. You've said that the government's Kashmir policy is, uh, is ad hoc and confused. But how do you see this particular cycle of decision making? Because there is a perception that this showed political will against India's anti-terror objectives. So one, uh, I think I continue to be a part of the system. Uh, having quit IAS, it doesn't mean that I have quit the service or quit the system, or I'm not anymore a part of the mainstream. Secondly, the last fortnight has been a horrific time for all of us. Uh, I was in my home and all of us were really waiting for these jets to crash over us and all these bombs to crash in through our roofs. We haven't slept. Uh, all Kashmir had gone for panic buying and we were preparing for maybe a war of a couple of months and people were thinking, what if there's a nuclear attack? Our children were totally agitated and we didn't know how to arrange for their baby food. So when there are hostilities between India and Pakistan, it's fundamentally the people of Jammu and Kashmir who become the worst sufferers of that war. So we would never want that war to happen. When Pulwama happened, Pulwama is one of the most terrible things that has happened in recent times, and our solidarities go to the families of the soldiers whose families got devastated. But then we have to also understand that there has been a war playing in our lives for the last 30 years. And every morning when my kid goes to school, my wife tells me that we don't know, will he come back? This war plays every evening in my house when my mom looks at the portrait of my dead father who lost his life in this conflict. And this war is playing the same way in all houses in Kashmir and Jammu and Ladakh. What are we talking about? Are we talking about escalation further from, the, from here onwards? If you talk about solutions, I have been critical of the policies of the central government because I believe that it's important that we de-escalate in Kashmir and in Jammu and in Ladakh while we are ta talking we still have so many families who are mourning this time because the cross LOC shelling has not stopped. Can, we, can India and Pakistan find some different ways of you know, dealing with each other rather than killing these goat herds at the borders? Can we reclaim those spaces which belong to civilian population and which are now presently you know, militarized spaces? Can we enlarge the democratic space in, the, in Kashmir Valley and kind of build people's trust in the mainstream and electoral processes? Can we do something about the sentiment of alienation? When Pulwama terror attack happened, what we saw afterwards is that an entire, an entire identity was criminalized in the rest of the country, and we saw hate crimes and targeted violence against innumerable Kashmiri students. Those people were ambas ambassadors of Kashmir in the rest of the country. When they came back, tell me what kind of sentiment are they harboring this time while they are sitting in Kashmir? What do you do with them? What kind of policies are we talking about? I think the policy has to be that let's go back to those old cliched ways of kind of dialogue and reconciliation and negotiation. Absolutely, war is not going to happen. War is not going to work. And, and Kashmir is going to be the worst place in this, uh, on this planet if war happens. Please, let's let the warmongers realize that this is not how this world is going to run. 
this is not what we deserve at least. Okay. Thank you. I just want to also say that uh, being anti-war uh, doesn't necessarily uh, run into conflict with being anti-terror. And I think India's objectives as far as that is concerned are very clear. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, Shah Faisal very importantly mentions the idea of de-escalation. Uh, Air Chief Major, the way things have happened over the last uh, few days since the Pulwama attack, uh, and they've happened in full public view, they've all been reported, uh, we have here on India Today as well, very factually. Uh, has the, have the decks been cleared for a de-escalation, is the question. And the reason I ask is because we know that the military is on high alert, and so, uh, so is the case on the other side. Uh, Shiv, I don't think there are any indications as of now of de-escalation. Absolutely not. But before I go further, let me make one point, you know, very, very clear, that like the airstrike on the 26th of this month, we must always remember that it was a very small tactical strike carried out by the Indian Air Force. But air power, whenever applied, and however small that strike is, it's, it, it was basically a tactical strike. But any air power projected always has a strategic effect. And that strategic effect was so very visible after the strike. Go back a few years to Kargil. What happened in Kargil? In Kargil, it was we were trying to evict some infiltrators till such time air power was used. And then the whole world came alive. Yeah, there is a problem in that part of the world. And therefore, while the capability exists with us for these kind of strikes, as I mentioned earlier, what is very, very important is if there are targets which are identified, mapped, and ready to hit. Now, if there is, a, if there is either, uh, uh, you know, we're scaling down on the conflict situation, or if the conflict uh, situation gets back because of some other provocations, the air option is always available to you, but with absolutely impeccable intelligence, which goes along with it. And that capability was amply demonstrated on the 26th strike, that till such time we had the correct intelligence available of the target, this strike couldn't have gone through. Now, whether there is going to be de the methods of de-escalation in my reckoning would again, the onus would lie on Pakistan. Okay, what kind of further either terrorist actions or any other action that Pakistan takes? Not on us. And as far as my personal opinion is that we shouldn't let our guard down till such time we get some very positive signals from across the border that, okay, we are actually pulling down and ensuring that we will not let terror operate from just, our land. Just to, just to clarify, Air Chief, are you saying that we wait for another provocation and then conduct another airstrike, or do we conduct those airstrikes when we have a target and we think that there is a threat from one of those places? The options are always open, but given the fact that there is no provocation from his side, I don't think we should, I mean, uh, uh, conduct an airstrike just because we want to. That doesn't make sense. Okay. General, General Huda, you know, the, one of the things that has, uh, uh, you know, is const a question that constantly comes up is, what has the deterrent effect of these uh, strikes been? Uh, whether it was the, uh, the, you know, the trans-LOC strikes called the surgical strikes in popular culture and these airstrikes in Balakot. Uh, there is constantly that question, you know, 
oh, but you know, after this there have been so many terror strikes, oh, after these air strikes they sent their, uh, you know, aircraft to attack us in Naushera on the 27th. As a military planner and a commander, how would you answer that question? Because the public at right now will be wanting to know if we sent our jets and projected this fantastic tactical air power, why is it that Pakistan has reacted and is continuing to attack us? Yeah, so we, uh, we need to understand, I think, um, unless uh, India is ready to go into a full-blown war, you know, after terror attacks like Pulwama, uh, we should understand that, you know, the military instrument or military power is only uh, one part of what the government should be doing. Uh, to imagine that, uh, you know, by, by an airstrike or by a cross-border strike, we are going to completely rule out Pakistan uh, doing what it's been doing for many, many years uh, is not going to happen. Uh, nor should we look at any short-term, uh, as Mr. Menon also pointed out, uh, any short-term results or gains. Uh, so yes, the military is an instrument, but in the context of two countries uh, with fairly uh, advanced powerful armies uh, with nuclear weapons, uh, I think we should also understand that military power has its limits. And therefore, it needs to be used uh, in conjunction with other instruments of, of national power and, and, and diplomacy, etc. And I, I you know, always say this, please have a long-term consistent approach. That's the only way I think we'll be able to get Pakistan to, you know, to deter from carrying out what they're, what they're doing. Uh, Mr. Menon, you're taking from what General Huda has said, uh, has, you know, have the events over the last few days, and I don't want to make it specifically about this because, after all, it is a long-term situation, but if you look at these last few days since the Pulwama attack, as a former National Security Advisor and uh, Foreign Secretary, is there an opportunity in these last few days, uh, and India projecting this hard power, to upgrade our foreign policy and correct some of the mistakes of it being much more long-term and much more consistent? Well, it depends, as I said, on what you want to achieve. It seems to me, yes, it's opened an opportunity. Nobody in the world stood up and said, oh, why have you attacked Pakistan? I mean, it's quite remarkable. Nobody stood up and took the Pakistani side in this, even though you did, you know, at, by your own account, cross the LOC, did various things which... Uh, so it seems to me that you have a moment here which, where the Pakistanis, if they... And I assume they are rational, like us, they're not suicidal, that they can also read the tea leaves. They can see what's happening, whether it's the OIC, they can see the world's reaction and so on. And they need the world much more today than they did before. You have a whole set of levers. I mean, today already your, your economy is what? Four times Pakistan will be, no, 10 times Pakistan, and will be about 40 times their size in 2035. You, you have a whole set of levers which you can actually use to try and change Pakistani behavior. Because as Air Marshal Major said, you've set a new standard for the use of military force. You've shown a certain willingness and you've, you've crossed certain lines which maybe they assumed they didn't. Deterrence is a subjective thing. It's a question of what he believes. And you now have a moment to recalibrate that by doing a whole range of things, as I said, not just the use of military force, but the other things. So yes, you have an opportunity. If you are clear in your mind that this is going to take time. The Israelis have a phrase for their counterterrorism, uh, which they say it's mowing the grass. It's not that you can solve the problem. There's no silver bullet, nothing. The grass will keep growing, but you have to keep going back in and mowing it and keeping it at a manageable level. You have to manage the problem. It's not as though, because much of what we face is in intrinsic to this comes out of the structure of Pakistan. You know, many of these, the way the jihadi tanzims flourish, their use by the Pakistan army as an instrument of state policy, these are not things that you and I can fix today or have a simple solution to. So we need to manage the problem and use all these levers at the same time. Uh, Shah Faisal, uh, you know, the, the government has been criticized, including by you, uh, about having a whimsical policy as far as Kashmir is concerned. Uh, the government has been criticized of having a, a sort of differing or inconsistent policy as far as Pakistan is concerned as well. Do you think that will change considering the things that have happened in the last few days? 
the, the show of political will to strike inside Pakistan against terror objectives, has that demonstrated to you a consistency that perhaps has been lacking before? I think uh, it doesn't really help because uh, Pakistan does remain a critical piece of the puzzle. I don't have to say much about that. But then at the same time, I'm more concerned about how we can possibly do something about the disengagement which is happening in Kashmir. I see it more of a demand side issue. You are talking more about a supply side issue. It's a demand side issue because in Kashmir this time there's appetite for what is happening. You have social endorsement to militancy which is unprecedented. You have youngsters who want to take to a path which was something which was prescribed till a uh, couple of years back. So my belief is that let's do something about the demand side issues. Let's, while you're doing all this, let's do something about enlarging the political space. What about the engagement? How long are you going to fight the war? What about the diplomacy as you were talking about? What about the youth? What about other opportunities which people want? What about, what about the sense of injustice which is kind of perpetrating? Uh, in, in, in an entire generation of Kashmiris. Let's do something about that. Otherwise, this is not a sustainable option. You cannot keep on fighting wars. My belief is that let's do something about the political engagement. I have been constantly talking about a lack of credible initiatives, which was something for which I criticized the government, because I believe you have to constantly keep engaging Kashmiris. And, and something has to be done about the political rights. We are seeing now these days Article 35A and Article 370 being in discussion. I mean, come on, how many times are we going to provoke people while somebody is trying to make peace? At the same time, you're trying to add new insults and new provocations and not letting the wounds to heal. That's, I think, going to be problematic and that's not going to work. General, General Huda, in the, last, in the last few weeks, or at least since uh, you know, the, the, the Uri surgical strikes, there has been a perception that the, the military and the government uh, especially in Jammu and Kashmir, have been largely on the same page, even though earlier there have been times when, you know, stories have come out about the military doing one thing and the political leadership, uh, you know, having a separate view on how things uh, need to go. How would you respond to Shah Faisal in that respect, that it can't be just one thing, it needs to be everything at once, and they need to come together? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, there are two parts to this problem in Kashmir, and uh, unfortunately, we only often look at one part. So there is one side which says, you know, the problem is only Pakistan. And if Pakistan stops doing all this, everything will cease. There is another side which says, you know, there's a huge internal issue uh, in Kashmir, and that, that needs to be resolved. Uh, you know, both parts uh, are together. So yes, there is uh, terror coming from Pakistan. And yes, we have a serious problem in Kashmir. I mean, we can't shut our eyes to issues that, you know, Shah Fazal is bringing out about alienation is going on. There are more and more youngsters who are sort of uh, picking up the gun. Uh, there is radicalization. Uh, political space seems to have shrunk. You know, I was surprised when, when the government was dismissed and governor rule was imposed, there was absolutely no murmur from the people that why has this happened. Uh, so I think these are issues that, that we, we need to look at. Uh, as far as the army and the government, uh, you know, sort of being on the same page, uh, obviously it's the political leadership, you know, which has to decide the direction and the army sort of goes uh, down that same path as to what, what the political... So I, I don't think there was ever any dissonance between uh, the central government and the army. Well, I haven't seen it uh, in my 40 years that there was any dissonance between the, the two parties. Uh, what often happens is that there, is, uh, there isn't enough clarity about uh, what the political objectives of the government are. Have they spelled it out that this is how we want things to go? Uh, because for the military, that's the start point. So once your political aim is and political objectives are absolutely clear, that's how then the military strategy to work towards that path gets drawn up. So often we hear that, you know, the political objectives are not, are not very clear. And that's why we say, you know, the army has often brought the situation uh, near, near normal, uh, but political steps, you know, for, for conflict resolution haven't taken place. So that's where I think we, we need to work a little more. Okay, so we have just a, uh, maybe a minute left, so I'll end with you, Air Chief. Uh, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Menon said that, uh, you know, a, a sign of our diplomatic strength has been that no country in the world has said why did India attack Pakistan, which is, which is a very important point to make. Considering we've, you know, crossed the Rubicon, as it were, with this application of air power in so-called peacetime, even though there's no such thing, uh, is there going to be a more concerted approach, military-wise, politics-wise, that same question, is there an opportunity now for a much more consistent approach? Uh, it was good that the government of the day decided to use air power in this, uh, uh, on the 26th of this month. Now, over the years I have seen that the successive governments had, have had a mindset on the use of air power. I really don't know not, why. Going back to 1962, when air power could have been used to a lot of our advantage, and right through time, and especially in this no war, no peace uh, scenario which obtains now, and in this hybrid conflict which is going on, I don't see any reason as to why air power cannot be used, especially in POJNK. International air power across international boundaries has a totally different connotation. Whereas in this area, I don't see any reason why air power cannot be used any time a, a, a lucrative target, as I keep saying, is available. Because we do not want, we are, we, we are fighting terrorism. I would go a step further, and at the cost of being proven totally wrong by many, here and elsewhere, that even in mainland Jammu, uh, Kashmir, in the valley, we unnecessarily lose so many of our soldiers after a terrorist strike, when they go after them. Why don't we use a helicopter gunship? Because eventually what happens, and I've seen it happening over and over again, that in the bargain of killing those terrorists, you blow up a house. So why don't you do the same thing from a safe distance and don't, and don't expose your b b people then? But again, there is a mindset to say, how can we use air power against our own people? Now the terrorist is certainly not our own person. He's somebody else. And I wouldn't hesitate to say that if you can use any kind of air power, not necessarily a 20 aeroplane strike, but even a single attack helicopter to sort out a, a terrorist problem on ground, I would say, why not? Thank you. Like I said, the world is watching, and the decisions that India takes militarily, politically, diplomatically is going to be something that virtually every country is going to be looking very closely at in the days to come. Gentlemen, thank you very much for this wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you.